This recording was produced by Oregon Trail Baptist Church. If you'd like to get more recordings or to leave your feedback, please visit us at www.otbchurch.com or write us at P.O. Box 298, Guernsey, Wyoming, 82214. We look forward to hearing from you, and we hope that today's recording will not just challenge your thinking, but will transform your life. Let's get started this morning. We are on uh, the Ten Commandments, so let's get started with Exodus 20. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments thou shalt not take the name of the lord thy god in vain for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maid servant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day, and hallowed it. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, Thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maid servant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. Exodus 20 verses 3 through 17. We are going to finish up the first handout I gave you on this today. There's just a little bit left on that, and then we'll start into the second. Uh, so I may try to make the second shorter. We'll see what happens here. We're uh, dealing here with the fourth commandment, and verses 8 to 11 is where we read that commandment. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, 
the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. We started looking at this commandment. We went through some of the key words of, of rest and how it's portrayed in Genesis and with the emphasis there. Uh, we started looking at how this gets looked at and approached through the Old Testament. And so if you want to pick up today at page 10 on the handout, so we're on Misuse of God's Day, Part 1, page 10. We'll close out here with the wisdom literature in the um, Old Testament. Psalm 92 serves as, it's got a title on it as the song for the Sabbath. And so as wisdom literature, this is a specific psalm dedicated to the Sabbath. Uh, and there we read, it says, It is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord, and to sing praises unto thy name, O Most High, to show forth thy loving kindness in the morning, and thy faithfulness every night. Upon an instrument of ten strings, and upon the psaltery, and upon the harp with a solemn sound, for thou, Lord, hast made me glad through thy work. I will triumph in the, the works of thy hands. O Lord, how great are thy works, and thy thoughts are very deep. A brutish man knoweth not, neither doth a fool understand this. When the wicked spring as the grass, and when all the workers of iniquity do flourish, it is, they, it is that they shall be destroyed forever. But thou, Lord, art most high forever. For lo, thine enemies, O Lord, for lo, thine enemies shall perish. All the workers of iniquity shall be scattered. But my horn shall thou exalt like the horn of a unicorn. I shall be uh, anointed with fresh oil. Mine eyes shall also see my desire on mine enemies, and mine ears shall hear my desire of the wicked that rise up against me. The righteous shall flourish like a, the palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall still bring forth in old age. They shall be fat and flourishing to show that the Lord is upright. He is my rock, and there is no unrighteousness in him. So here we have a psalm dealing with the Sabbath. Are you picking up anything in this psalm related to some of the commands or instructions with the Sabbath so far? Do you see anything that the psalm is echoing that's already been brought up as we've looked through the prophets and uh, the, the law or five books of Moses? Okay, so there's, there's the element brought in where, remember how it, it talked about the Sabbath being a day to afflict your souls and prayer and fasting and praising the Lord? So this psalm is very much embodying that. Where it's a, it's a song focusing our thoughts on the Lord, is it not? Just the whole thing's recounting His power, His glory, how, yes, the enemies may be raised up for a time, but it's ultimately God who will scatter and destroy them. Um, so here, even in their approach to, left that on again, uh, even in their approach to how they sing psalms on the Sabbath day, uh, it's a time to focus their thoughts and attention on the Lord. Uh, and I'm not going to do a full exposition of this song today. That's not the point of what we're looking at. But we see here that this is part of, whether they sung this on Sabbath day every week or, or however they structured that, there is a center on focusing on the Lord and His power and His strength and His ability on the Sabbath. And that's important because as humans, we tend to focus on anything so long that we lose focus of other things, don't we? We focus on a problem or a situation or, or whatever, and we lose focus. And so that constant weekly bringing us back to focus on, okay, who's really in charge here? Who's in control? What's going on is helpful for all of us. So, Also we have uh, in uh, the book of Lamentations, bottom of page 11 here, it highlights the pain of not having a Sabbath. Uh, note here uh, under the heading, Lamentations 2.9 highlights the judgment of the Lord that separated the people of Judah and Israel from celebrating the Sabbath. The passage shows that the inability to celebrate the Sabbath and the restrictions is painful for the people. 
And there in chapter 2, verse 6, we read, And he hath violently taken away his tabernacle, as it were a garden. He hath destroyed his places of assembly. The Lord hath, hath caused a sol- the solemn feasts and Sabbaths to be forgotten in Zion. And it despised the indignation of his anger, the king and the priest. What two things were taken away in exile here according to this verse? Okay, they lost their freedom to worship on the Sabbath. And what was the other thing that got taken away? This was very physical. The temple, the tabernacle. This is, for me, a helpful way to think of the Sabbath. The tabernacle or the temple was God's place. It was a physical location. The Sabbath is God's time. Now, the Sabbath got more developed in the exile. They weren't always observing it in the land, but when you no longer have a temple to focus your worship in, they spent more focus on the Sabbath. It's during the exile where, um, I guess let me ask this, how does a synagogue fit in? We don't see synagogues in the Old Testament, but by the time Jesus is walking on the earth, there's synagogues. What is a synagogue? What makes it different than a temple? And what's kind of the history there? Anybody know? Synagogues, do they have a holy place? Do they have that interchange? No, okay. they don't. So they're like a church, whereas the temple was... Okay, they're going to be closer to a church than the temple. It's a local place. It's, yes, it's very local. Synagogues started in the Babylonian exile. They've gone on through history. Wherever you find a Jewish community, you can find a synagogue. That's why when uh, Paul was traveling the Roman Empire, he would go to the synagogue. Synagogues became places of teaching and meeting. They weren't... I wouldn't say they wouldn't worship there, but for Jews, there's only one place to worship, and that's at Jerusalem. But when you're in captivity, you can't go to Jerusalem. So it became, in some senses, a, a substitute... Or a, a second hand, we can't go to the temple, we're, we're bound in exile, we can't do this now. So they would come together on the Sabbath synagogues, and that's where uh, it would be kind of like their version of a church service. Um, and, and that's why today, I mean, you can go to Cheyenne, there's a synagogue in Cheyenne. And um, so they're different than a temple, they're more centers of teaching. Uh, but that started in the, the exile, but these two things, the temple and their Sabbaths, were taken away. You ever had something taken away that you didn't appreciate the value of it until it was gone? I think the Babylonian exile was a good learning experience for God's people, but it didn't teach them everything because we read about when they came back and they still had the same problems. So, anyway... Uh, The prophetic books here, page 12, um, they use the Sabbath as an example of how Israel ritualized God's commands. What what do I mean by ritualized? Okay, and and that's probably a good correlation. It goes, um, and when you think of the Catholic Church and you think of ritual, what are you... What comes to mind? Well, the repetitive prayer okay. answers the, the repetitive. Everything is very organized. It's, it's, it's a ritual. Okay, and I, I'm going to play with you here. Does organized mean bad? No. So what? it's moved beyond organized to what? Wrote. It's yeah. Wrote. You ever heard someone read the Lord's Prayer and it was just like yeah. dead? Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth. I mean, it's just like, it, it's the words are there, but the life is not. Um, you read even outside Catholic circles, there's prayer books and things, and to read some of those prayers can be encouraging, and your heart echoes with them, but it beco- to ritualize something means it's becoming... It's becoming tit for tat. It's becoming, think magical incantations. If I say these words, if I do this, 
God will do this or that. Now, is that how our God functions? We covered this kind of in idolatry. Um, we, we don't coerce God in any way. There's no formula like A plus B equals God has to do what I say. That doesn't work with God because it's not about ritual, but about what? The heart. Relationship. What's that? Yes. So the prophets, they pick up on this concept of how in Israel's worship system, it became nothing but a ritual. Now, you look at the Old Testament sacrificial system, there was a lot of ritual to it. Right now, a lot of people who are leaving I was evangelical churches and going to other churches, the, one of the largest portions leaving and going to other churches, they're going to churches with lots of ritual. One of the reasons for that is ritual or tradition in some of those ways. It's not necessarily bad, okay? There's symbolism in, in things that you see and, and they are visual reminders and, and that structure. But if you remember, some of these people are coming out of churches where you go to church service and there's not much difference between the church service and a rock concert. I mean, it's just, they're looking for something more. I, I'm not saying they're finding it, I, they're leaving churches. So the idea of ritualizing something, making it actions you do just simply to make God happy, it doesn't please God. So here are the prophets, like Isaiah says, bring no more vain oblations. Incense is an abomination unto me. The new moons and Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies, I cannot away with. It is iniquity. It's all a meal. The things God requested, the things God commanded, he couldn't stand. Is God schizophrenic? No. He couldn't stand them because their heart wasn't there in them. It became something they just went through the motions of. Ezekiel 22, thou hast despised my holy things and hast profaned my Sabbaths, later in that passage. Her priests have violated my laws and have profaned my holy things. They have put no difference between the holy and profane. Neither have they showed the difference between the unclean and the clean and have hid their eyes from my Sabbaths and I am profaned among them. So here the priests, the religious leaders, are not even honoring the Lord with the Sabbaths. And it says here this ending phrase, I am profaned among them. They are to be the ones leading people to the Lord in worship and leading the, the nation in understanding of the law. And they're profaning God himself. So the ritual stinks in his nostrils. Ezekiel 23 here Moreover, this they have done unto me. They have defiled my sanctuary. In the same day, they have profaned my Sabbaths. So, very much a negative here in the prophetic books. There, The idea that the Sabbath became just something you did stunk in the eyes of God and the prophets, or in the nostrils of God, and the prophets are speaking out against this. Jeremiah would warn that ignoring the Sabbath would lead to exile. Now, this is kind of rep repetitious because didn't Moses write this back in Leviticus? So here's Jeremiah who goes through the exile time period and he's warning them, hey, if you don't do this, exile's coming. Uh, and he says in Jeremiah 17, Thus saith the Lord, Take heed to yourselves and bear no burden on the Sabbath day, nor bring it by the gates of Jerusalem, neither carry forth a burden out of your houses on the Sabbath day, Neither do ye any work, but hallow ye the Sabbath day, as I commanded your fathers. But they obeyed not, neither inclined their ear, but made their necks stiff, that they might not hear nor receive instruction. And it shall come to pass, if ye diligently hearken unto me, saith the Lord, to bring in no burden to the gates of this city on the Sabbath day, but to hallow the Sabbath day, to do no work therein. Hosea carries on this same theme that Jeremiah and Isaiah and Ezekiel have I have referenced. He says in Hosea chapter 2, I will cause all myrrh to cease, her feast days, her new moons, and her Sabbaths, and all her solemn feasts. So he's warning here that your Sabbath, your rest, will be taken away. Now there's an element here of, as humans, what is the one thing people look forward to? Isn't it rest? 
We look forward to a break. And, and whether we see that in the American dream with living for the weekend or living for the, a vacation, living for retirement where I'm going to take it easy, and then most people I talk to, that's not how retirement functions. But anyway, um, they're looking for that rest. And yet when you don't take the rest God provides and gives, it'll be taken away and your options are limited. When you're a slave, when the Israelites were slaves in Egypt and in Babylon when they were taken captive, their options were limited. Uh, Amos describes how the people couldn't wait for the Sabbath to be over. In Amos 5, or chapter 8, verse 5, saying, When will the new moon's moon be gone that we may sell corn and the Sabbath that we may set forth wheat making an ephod small and a shekel great and satisfying the balances by deceit so here they're, 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 they're being shysters in business but they can't wait for the Sabbath to be over so they can get back to business they can't wait to re-engage with business I had a professor in college and he stopped his class at one point and he said now when you're study, study and when you take a break, take a break. You know, that's really sound, good advice. But there's an element to not, not forget here the fact that God's given the Sabbath. Put those other things away for the day. Just, you know, don't be antsy. Okay, I, can't, I, I shouldn't do this today, so, you know, I've got to do this or that. And, I, and I've read of some preachers who, when they grew up as children... Uh, their parents or their church had so many strict laws about what you rules, what you could or couldn't do on Sundays, that the kids grew to despise Sunday. They couldn't play outside. They couldn't do this. They couldn't do that. And so the kids couldn't wait for Sunday to be over. And I can see that, especially from a kid's mind. As an adult, a Sunday afternoon nap is wonderful. I'm just telling you. It's just, it's wonderful to reset. Do my kids need it? Yes. Do they think they need it? No. All right. So... Anyway, we're going to jump into the next handout here. Comments, questions from the first lesson? This one we probably covered quickly. I say probably. I make wishful thinking there. It's probably back here snickering at me. What's that? Oh. All right, so... What I want to do here is jump into, we've kind of covered the gamut of the Old Testament and how the Sabbath got looked at and viewed. This lesson is not actually focused on Scripture. I know that's a bad thing to say for a Sunday school lesson. But it's going to give us some background between what happens in the Old Testament before we get to the New Testament. So we're going to talk about the intertestamental period. Now I'm going to stop here and pause at that word. What does intertestamental period mean? Yes, yep, okay. Now, that is the same as what people call the second temple period. So what's the, why the difference in terms? Anybody know? A lot of your older scholars will say intertestamental period, but a lot of the modern guys avoid that term and they say second temple. I picked up an, oh, go ahead. No, it's not with that. It's actually to do with being a sensitive to Jewish people and non-Christians. So how it is intertestamental assumes the idea, which as believers we would take, that there's two testaments, the old and the new. So the intertestamental is a term that goes between. But if you're a Jew and you don't believe in the New Testament then you have no intertestamental period because there's only a post-testamental period. And the time frame still covers the second temple, the temple that was built under Ezra and Nehemiah. That temple lasted until um, about 70 AD when it was torn down. So that period of time is what this is referring to. So now that you have kind of the terms, to say second temple, and I will switch back and forth myself in what I use, I read in the week, and I probably go back and forth. To say Second Temple is a bit gracious to anyone who's not of a Christian persuasion. All right, we'll just put it that way. Yeah. The Jews today, they really refer more to the temple that Herod, in the time of Christ, the temple that existed then. 
Yeah. So, so they're, and they're looking forward to building another one too. So, yeah. And so there's a lot there. So, so the old intertestamental period ends and Judaism begins, how do I say this? Rethinking and reevaluating and how are we going to apply the Ten Commandments? How are we going to apply this Sabbath law? There's one document. It was found in the Cairo Geniza. Um, and it was also found portions of it in the Dead Sea Scrolls, which is interesting because we just went to that exhibit. The document's called the Damascus Document. Um, it went by a couple other names. It's abbreviated as CD, which does, I don't find helpful. Um, but anyway, this document make specific things that you can and can't do on Sunday. For instance, you can't walk further than a thousand cubits, and a cubit's about 18 inches, give or take, What if you're talking Egyptian or Syrian cubit. Um, you can't drink outside of the camp. You can't draw water into any vessel. You can't wear perfume on the Sabbath day. That's up against the rules. You can't open a sealed vessel. You cannot assist an animal to give birth or help an animal out of a pit. Now, wait a minute. Is this ringing any bells of, you know, didn't the Old Testament say that you could do that? <laughs> okay. Um, you couldn't even talk about work or money. And there's some other things. I added an appendix at the back. If you want to read the section yourself, you could go read it later. <laughs> right? So you see this development that, it's very much stringent on laws and regulation. But Jubilees does a lot. It adds some more prohibitions. It adds plowing a field, starting a fire, riding an animal, riding in a boat, killing anything, making war. These are all forbidden on the Sabbath day. Now, Josephus records some funny things that happened where certain battles, they would literally wait until the Sabbath, and then they would attack because they knew the Jews would not fight on the Sabbath day. So this is happening and over and over and over. Uh, Assyria and Babylon takes advantage of this. Uh, and in 1 Maccabees, which you may remember, that's in uh, the Catholic Apocrypha. Uh, Matthias, which is one of the Maccabees, uh, and I'm going to bring in a corny joke from our kids' video. It's Maccabees, not, not a pack of bees. It's a Mac Maccabees. It's a group of brothers. Anyway. He decides to change this, and they're going to actually defend themselves on the Sabbath day. So in 1 Maccabees 2, verse 38, so they rose up against them in battle on the Sabbath day and slew them with their wives and children and their cattle to the number of a thousand people. So there's this back and forth here of what's going on. Now, this is not what all Jews think. You, it's like America. Does everybody here think the same? No. Okay. So then you have this other group of the Pharisees and their rabbinic tradition, and they're a bit more open to doing things on the Sabbath. Now, some of the things I just read to you, you couldn't save someone's life, you couldn't help an animal, you couldn't do those things. You're really limited. But the Pharisees took more, it was, they tended to be more humane or easier to obey the law, in theory, than the community at Qumran or like this Damascus document. So they would allow some of these things. And in my mind, I'm thinking, didn't Jesus say to them, which of you wouldn't pull ox out of the ditch on the Sabbath day? So it tells me Jesus, A, knew his crowd of who he was talking to. But this body of literature that really puts a damper on doing anything on the Sabbath day, it was around... It was floating. It was there at Qumran with, the, um, with that community. Uh, so I bring this up, and I, and I did it quickly and short here, because I want you to, as you, you read through some of this, or we covered some of this, we see excesses to the Sabbath. We see rules and regulation that really, th some of them are in direct contradiction to Scripture. And some of them, it's like, Really? Is common sense out the window? And yet, can we do the same today? Now, any, anybody want to give any examples of way maybe, maybe you've seen people today really take this too far?
Eat me on Sunday. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, so you go to church, and then who cares if you go on the, on the afternoon? Yeah. Well, because because a hunt can be relaxing, it can be enjoyable. But yeah. You, you took time out to thank God first. Yeah. When we are. Yeah. The Super there you go. Yeah. yeah. And that's probably more the air of our culture, is is that? Although, there's um, I should watch the DVD now that I'm teaching on the Sabbath. I have a DVD in my library, and the person who gave it to me. Had, he had some books at a book table at our church in Chicago. And, and he's a good man and he loves the Lord, but he would not sell a book on Sunday. So he's only at our church on Sunday, okay? And then he's going to be gone back to where he lives. And, but he wouldn't sell any books on Sunday. So what happens is you pick out the books you want, you make a list, they put a post-it note on top of the price. You put that back in what ended up as my office and then they're supposed to bring me the money, and then the church is supposed to send him a check. I'm like, this just got complicated really quick. And I'm like, it just, it, it lost the simplicity. D does that make sense? Now, is it wrong for a church to have a bookstore? No, I don't think so. Should the church charge for the books? Well, that's their choice. Honestly, if everybody who wanted a book just came to me to get a free book, we'd be broke. I don't publish these things and print these things. But at the same time, when are people going to a church? Sunday and Wednesday, right? So when's a good time for them to get? So you say, is that work? Well, in one sense, I suppose it is, but it's, they're trying to serve the people. And it's, they're trying to assist them in their spiritual life. Yeah. Right. Farm country, and you know, what do you do if you have a you know, duck house have to be milk? Right. Um, or you've got it's calving season, and the the cow. So, so actually, my wife and I mentioned that. You know, we're like, if you got a cow that you know is about to calve, and you stay home, I get it. But if you schedule your branding on Sunday, it's like, what are you doing? <laughs> Does that make sense? <laughs> you, you know. Um, because you cannot control biological animals. You got no control over that. But, you, but what you do have control over, we should be cautious of. I, I was, we were just chatting ourselves. I make it a practice not to, I try not to get gas on Sunday. I try not to go shopping at the store on Sunday. I try not to do any of those things. I just try to keep it as special as possible. Now. The situations happen many times here where someone comes to church and realizes we have a food function that day and they feel bad because they haven't brought anything. So they run to the grocery store and grab something. I got no problem with that. That's fine. Why? Well, their plans change for the day. You know, there are those who you can't go out to eat on Sunday. That is a forbidden no no. Well, I've kind of got to the point of. Well, if we go out to eat on Sunday, I'm giving my wife a break, right? Now, you say, well, I'm forcing someone else to work. They're there. <laughs> They're going to be there anyway, right? So we, we don't go out to eat all the time on Sunday, but I don't have a conscious offense if I get invited out to eat, go out to eat on Sunday. Fine, you know? Um, that's where I'm at on it, on, on the balance of, if we go to Douglas to visit Douglas Baptist, I don't have a problem getting gas up there, because I know I'm going to get it cheaper than if I drive back to Guernsey. But, maybe, maybe. but at least I'll check the prices, right? Um, but at the same time, I, I'm going to try to make those little decisions so that my Sabbath, my Sunday, can be special. Does that make make sense? And we can kind of see the Jews really, they seem to polarize in different groups of gung-ho this or gung-ho that. And as Christians, I don't think we've got too far from that. We, we can still do the same thing. And I think as a wholesale, our culture today doesn't treat the Sabbath, doesn't treat Sunday like it used to. Um, 
you see that schools used to not schedule any games on Wednesday nights and Sundays. But that's becoming more and more prevalent. Well, I'm going to say, can you blame the schools? You can't blame them because it doesn't impact as many of the people as it used to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so uh, it's really a failure on the church, not the world. So, comments, questions before we close out here today? Then what do you do when you have a homeschool group and they want to go play a certain school? On a certain day. On a certain day, then they're they're excluded from it. And and this is where I kind of, we'll get to this with the New Testament side. The Lord is the Lord of the Sabbath. And there comes a level of conscience of what you will and won't do. And I find what we choose to do on the Sabbath day, uh, when we make choices to honor it, God honors us. And uh, one, one way I, I see this happening, there is a group that came across the Oregon Trail uh, years ago, wagon train, and they moved out with a whole party and them said, well, we're not going to move on Sunday. We're going to take our Sunday break. And the other said, well, there's no way we're going to make it if we do that. We've got to go seven days a week. So they made it the first week, and that part of the group stayed, and we're taking a break, and part of the group went on. Most of the group that didn't rest didn't make it. And the group that did rest, they fared much better. Um, and and they, they ultimately made, most of them made it to the destination. Now, it's still hard. Um, but, you know, I think of our men fighting today. Could you imagine if they took the approach of, okay, on Sundays, everybody gets the day off. It just doesn't work. Now, I think what could be done is if, if, if you're a general or a commander and you, you're in charge of a unit, what you could do is rotate what guys get what days off. You know, so at least they're getting a day off every seven days, you know, but... Um, there is some practical things, but we, we are privileged to walk with the Lord. So we have the insight of law. We have history, and we can see what the Jews did or didn't do, and what worked and what didn't. But we get to walk with Christ, and we get to take these commands, and we get to apply them to today as best as we can. And so Christians are going to differ on some of this. And instead of shooting at each other, let's just focus on walking with the Lord and doing what he's called us to do. So let's close out in prayer, and we hopefully we'll pick up on the New Testament view of it next week. Lord, we thank you for your word here this morning, and Lord, we thank you for the gift of the Sabbath and how, Lord, your people really despised them and profaned them until it was taken away, and then they realized what they missed. And Lord, would you enable us now to really take, not advantage of, but would we enjoy the gift of the Sabbath that you've given to us? Lord, would we be willing to rest knowing that you work in spite of our resting and that you multiply the work we do in six days to where it's more abundant even than we can imagine? And uh, Lord, we just ask that you'd bless our service to follow in your son's name. Amen. Amen.